In this video, we're going to be talking about the first part of supermarket refrigeration and supermarket equipment. Now, we've already talked about refrigeration. We've talked about domestic refrigeration. We've talked about all the components of the system. But with the exception of ice machines, the supermarket refrigeration systems are going to be some of the more complex equipment you have. So, the most common refrigeration system used in the traditional supermarkets are called the multiple DX systems. In other words, we have a compressor located in a machine room near the back of the store or on the roof. Okay, the heat rejection is normally accomplished with air-cooled condensers because they're the easiest to maintain. Refrigerant is then piped to direct expansion coils, that's DX, direct expansion, located within the cases and then back again. This is an example of you, what you would find in the typical supermarket refrigeration system. You'll have an engine room or a mechanical room someplace in the back of the building. Okay, from there you'll have display cases around the sales area. Sometimes they're differentiated by product, sometimes by area, and, so, and then you might have produce, which is a higher temp, um, high humidity environment. So you you have all this around here and it's all piped back usually under the slab to the mechanical room some supermarket systems will be designed to use a single compressor for each refrigerated case others are designed to use multiple refrigerated cases connected to a single compressor some supermarket systems will also use what's called a rack system a rack system is a rack of multiple compressors piped together and connected to multiple refrigerated cases. This is the most common configuration for multiplex DX systems. Okay, a typical system, you're going to have a remote condenser, usually on the roof or behind the building. You're going to have a receiver. Okay, then you're going to come out through a liquid manifold, through valves and other um, TXVs or other expansion devices to individual display cases. Then you're going to be coming out of the evaporators and you're going to come back to a suction manifold and you're going to come into multiple parallel compressors into a single discharge manifold and back to the condenser where the whole cycle starts all over again. Notice that you have, a, you have two manifolds in here. Okay, on the compressors, you have a suction manifold and you have a discharge manifold. Notice you have a manifold on the liquid side as well, all with valves capable of closing down and opening parts of the system. Most often there are multiple racks that serve a number of cases that are operating at different temperatures. For, their, for example, there may be a 15 degree Fahrenheit rack, a 20 degree Fahrenheit rack, and a negative 25 degree Fahrenheit rack. By using individual racks, it allows the refrigerant temperature in the case evaporate coil to the case operating temperature. This is accomplished by rack suction pressure controls, which indirectly controls the refrigerant temperature for the rack. Again, remember, we know the temperature of refrigerant versus the pressure of refrigerants. There's a temperature pressure relationship. So if I want a rack cooling at 32 degrees, okay, if I want to maintain my evaporators at 32 degrees, I just need to know what the pressure is that matches 32 degrees for that specific refrigerant. Most racks will utilize more than one compressor, usually three to five. By doing so, it gives the system an efficiency advantage by having multiple parallel compressors. These compressors might have different capacities. Supermarket systems have to be designed for full load operation, even though the actual load is generally below peak load. Think about it. Once a case is cool and once the product is cool inside that case, it takes a lot less refrigeration to maintain that cool. Okay, so when the truck first comes in and the product on the truck is a little bit warmer, okay, it's going to take it a little bit extra to cool it down to the temperatures that I expect. A rack that utilizes multiple parallel compressors is better designed to match the load under varying conditions. It helps eliminate wasted energy and frequent cycling of the compressors on and off. 
Here's an example scenario. Three 10 horsepower compressors using an even parallel rack system will provide the four capacities of 0, 10, 20, or 30 horsepower. An uneven parallel rack of 1, 10, 220 compressors will provide more combinations that include 0, everything's off, 10, 1, you have 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50. So you have slightly more capacities available if you use an uneven rack system. All it means, even rack, means all the compressors are the same. Uneven rack means that the compressors have varying capacities on that rack. Four compressors can provide ten different capacities or more. How do they work? The uneven rack systems rely on a microprocessor control and control system software that provides the temperature and pressure sensor information for accurate and repeatable control. Anytime we're dealing with food and refrigeration, we have to have accurate and repeatable. In other words, we need to be able to repeat this over and over and over again for the life of the system. So this is what's considered a typical compressor rack. Okay, notice we have three compressors. Piping from a rack system to the individual cases is carried in trenches underneath the floor or sometimes overhead using hangers. The piping must be properly insulated and isolated to prevent the possibility of electrolytic action. Electrolytic action, okay, you can't have copper come in contact with a lot of other materials, including concrete, or the just the electrolytic action, the reaction between the copper the stray voltages, and the metal will cause corrosion. One disadvantage to a parallel system is that a single refrigerant leak can shut down a sizable number of cases. Compressor racks will include many standard refrigeration system components depending on their type and design. Liquid line dryers are installed to remove water from the system, and they must be periodically replaced as a preventative maintenance item. Compressor oil is separated from the discharge gas and returned to the crankcase. Compressor safety and cycling controls include high pressure and low pressure switches. Subcoolers are used to lower the temperature of the liquid refrigerant, leaving the machine room to reduce the amount of flash gas through the expansion device located at the inlet of the refrigerated case or evaporated coil. In other words, we need to have pure liquid coming through the expansion devices. We cannot have gas prior to the expansion device. So we might have a liquid line dryer. We have our oil separators. We've talked about this before. We have our discharge headers. We have our condensers. This is basically just a typical refrigeration system with the addition of the manifolds or headers. The refrigerant must travel from where the compressor is located in the machine room throughout the store to individual refrigerated cases. This can result in a massive amount of refrigerant, sometimes as much as 3,000 pounds to 5,500 pounds of refrigerant. These coils will have temperature and refrigerant sub superheat controllers. Some older systems may have typical solenoid valves that open and close to control the case temperature and diaphragm-operated TVs for superheat control. Newer systems use mostly electronic valves and controls. Electronically controlled expansion valves can pulse with modulate, heat motor valves, or step motor valves. These valves do not rely on diaphragm operation like traditional expansion valves. A separate case controller that receives temperature and pressure inputs from the coil will electronically control the valve. Okay, electronically controlled expansion valves. There's a picture of one on the left-hand side in a Meath case. The right-hand picture shows how these things are connected. They're step motors. They have pulse action and they step to the next position, either open or closed. These types of valves open and close quickly to control refrigerant flow to the coil. Within six seconds, a voltage signal from the controller will be transmitted in to and removed from the valve coil. If there's a demand for refrigerant, the valve will remain open for almost all of the six seconds. 
If little demand is present, the valve will stay open for a fraction of the six-second period. In other words, there's very quick feedback. We send a signal, then we get very fast feedback. We either keep the valve open or close it. Case controllers receive input from the coil sensors measuring temperatures and pressures. These electronic controllers are able to regulate all of the case functions such as day and night thermostats, defrost, fan control, and alarm functions. Where electronically controlled valves are used, the typical case configuration is not very difficult from that found in a traditional refrigeration system. There will be a case temperature sensor acting as a thermostat. There will be a temperature and pressure sensor to monitor the refrigerate condition of the refrigerant leaving the coil for superheat control. And these sensors will send information to the controllers, which then regulate the valve accordingly. These inputs will also be used to determine if alarm conditions have been met. By alarm conditions, we mean do we notify a service tech, do we notify a store manager, do we notify headquarters, depending on the type of operation it is. So alarm conditions could be too low of a temperature, too high of a temperature during normal operation, too high of a temperature cool down after internal or external stop, defrost cycle, power failure, appliance cleaning. Defrost is also individual, okay? There are a number of different defrost methods that can be used, such as natural defrost, electric heat, or hot gas. There's many different ways to begin a defrost cycle. They can be manual defrost. Someone has to go do it by hand. Regular interval defrost or automatic defrost, also known as adaptive defrost. These are also in order of efficiency. Manual defrost is the least efficient. Regular interval defrost just means it's going to go into defrost whether or not it needs it. Automatic defrost or adaptive defrost just says when the case needs it, it's going to go into defrost. Manual defrost is initiated when a controller is set to begin a defrost sequence. Regular interval defrost can be set by programming it to begin on a regular basis, such as every eight hours. Automatic or adaptive defrost occurs when a sensor indicates that there's a need to begin a defrost cycle. Too much ice on a coil. Adaptive defrost is initiated based on a set of parameters rather than time. For example, if the registered airflow through a coil is blocked due to ice buildup, then the defrost cycle will be initiated. The controller may not require an actual airflow measurement, but bases it off pressures and temperatures and then defrost may begin. So that's the end of part one. We are gonna, there's a part two of the, of the supermarket refrigeration.